Well, Muhammad Yunus and the Grameen Bank were awarded the prize for the pioneering program of giving microcredit loans to the poor. For a close, closer look at microcredit, we're joined by Susan Davis. She helped to found and is chairperson of the Grameen Foundation. She's also chair of the Ashoka Global Academy for Social Entrepreneurship and advisor to the International Labor Organization. Explain exactly how it works. Microcredit is a poor woman's survival strategy, so it's a little loan without collateral. Um, she would form a group with four other peers, so together as a group of five, they would work with eight other groups in a center of 40. They would then have a Grammy bank worker come to them, to their village. They do a lot of the discussing of whether this is a good idea or not. Well, does she know how to make tasty sweets? Will they sell? Um, can she actually raise you know, goats or cows or sell the eggs from chickens? Is it a good idea? So they do that screening. Then they conduct all their business in public. Transparency creates accountability. No one rips off anybody because they all see all the loans given. They see all the loans being repaid right in front of themselves. They may not be literate or even numerate, but they know how to watch and count when it comes to their own money. So they take little loans. Now they can do it from as short as three months to as long as three years. Um, usually right now they're averaging about $120. Um, they've made loans to seven million women in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. I wanted to read uh, you uh, a quote from an article by Alexander Coburn, editor of Counterpunch, uh, who cites the Indian journalist P. Sanath, who says, the interest rates micro-indebted women are paying in India are far higher than commercial bank lending rates. Coburn writes, quote, today the World Bank and the IMF along with state-owned and commercial banks are diving into microfinance. The microloan business is fast becoming a gigantic empire, bringing back into control the very banks and bureaucracies women have been trying to bypass. Microcredit is becoming a macro racket. Um, the, the rate that Grameen charges is 20% um, simple interest, so that's not compounded. It's on a declining balance. Um, it'll average then in real terms about 12%. Uh, the key thing of whatever rate is charged, it is covering the cost of actually bringing credit to the borrower over and over and over again, sustainable for a lifetime. If you look at um, the extra cost to bring little loans to a lot of people, uh, you actually have to have slightly higher rates. That's why credit cards um, will charge a higher rate than, in fact, um, making one you know $100 million loan to a big corporation. We're talking to Susan Davis and also Dr. Vandana Shiva, world-renowned environmental leader, physicist, and ecologist, joins us. Your response to hear that Mohammed Yunus and the whole Grameen Bank had won the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, I'm very happy that uh, the Grameen Bank and Yunus got the Nobel Peace Prize. I would only say, let us not think this is a solution to every situation that creates poverty. It's a solution in a particular context, but it cannot be the solution when land is being grabbed from the peasants and leaving them in poverty. For example, in this whole land grab under the special economic zones that's taking place in India right now, and foreign direct investment in real estate is part of the driving force for this. That cannot be solved by microcredit. It needs a solution in terms of respecting the land rights of the peasants and not treating land of the poor as something that can be grabbed by the rich. The ri I think there's a second context in which microcredit could actually create a problem. And it's the kind of context in which we've been forced to work as credit for unaffordable seeds moves non-renewable seeds, genetically engineered seeds, hybrid seeds into rural areas in India. We are seeing a new kind of debt trap created. Farmer suicides, of which there have been 150,000 in the last decade of market opening, made possible because of credit, micro and macro. And it's being made possible by putting money available, credit available, so that they could get seeds of Monsanto. And in fact, it's a debate, old debate I've had with Yunus, because he, there was a time he was going to use microcredit to move GM seeds and Monsanto seeds to the Bangladeshi women, and we had to have a debate. And thank goodness he backed out of that agreement. Well, I remember this letter that you wrote many years ago. It was going to be called, what, Monsanto Grameen uh, Partnership. And it was announced at the big microcredit summit. Uh, so the point is, credit is a vector. Where does that vector lead you to? Does it lead you to a 
participation in a debt cycle that you can never get out of. I think one of the key issues about credit has to be, is it a debt trap sucking people in to permanent dependence on more and more and more borrowing? And the second thing I think that's very critical is, at least in, in India, we have witnessed how microcredit is being used to turn autonomous producers, sovereign producers, into consumers. Levers has hijacked the entire microcredit system in Madhya Pradesh, this big giant agribusiness. And today women who were producing their soaps and their potato chips are today sellers of levers detergents. And they are called Shakti Ammas, when actually what microcredit has done is disempowered the women in terms of robbing them of their productive capacity. It's not microcredit that's robbing them of uh, their livelihoods here. It's the microcredit is an instrument, it's a strategy, and it can be, um, it's just like Bishop Tutu said about a knife. Uh, it can be both harmful and benign. You can use a knife to slice bread or you can use it to stab someone in the heart. Microcredit um, in the hands of an institution that is trying to promote development and it's women's self-empowerment um, is a very powerful and robust instrument. What it does, as Eunice talked about at the Nobel ceremony, is it creates a platform for wider development. What he's talking about is the active construction of an alternative. He's talking about being able to have assets uh, and uh, being owned by these people themselves that we're talking about always as the victims of whatever injustice. It's a very unjust world, but he says ingenuity, intelligence, opportunity is not unevenly distributed, and all people need is a chance. And that's why credit can be, should be a basic human right, because through that they can access many other of their rights. Now, I agree that it's an instrument, and it's an in instrument in certain contexts. We need other instruments too. In Earth's democracy, that's what I've talked about. The instruments necessary to defend the rights to water as a common resource. Credit, loans, money circulation cannot solve the problems of alienation, of participating in Earth's democracy. Privatization of water leading to a high cost of water could be financed by flows of credit, but the solution to access to water is rights to water. Rights cannot be substituted by credit. Rights need to be recognized as rights and collective rights to the common wealth of this planet. The atmosphere, the water, the seeds, the biodiversity, that needs a rights solution. Credit can come after that rights solution has been offered. I think uh, in this world, um, it's not rights deigned from on high. I think rights are only real when, in fact, uh, people can uh, exercise their rights. And so what you see here is a very practical solution about people being able to organize for power and being able to also give voice um, to the various needs. Right now, Muslim women actually have title to land and own their homestead because of a simple formula in being able to say, we're not going to give you a housing loan unless the land is in um, the name of that woman. And I think you would agree that uh, organizing people so that they can promote their own collective interests is the way to actually um, realize the, the, the rights that may be on the books de jure, but are never going to be enforced de facto unless people have some means of power. So first, they have to stabilize their own household. They be, have to be able to, to eat every day. They have to be able to imagine that they have a future. And then they are able to actually take action in the social and political and economic spheres. You know, we're, we're all playing in a, in a global arena where capitalism is the dominant form. It's like capital is oil to the engine, right? So that's why we're saying if, um, if poverty is a disease, then microfinance is a good vaccine. It's not an issue of creating another future, it's an issue of defending the future that, uh, that is in people's hands right now. I think we need to recognize that there are systems beyond capital, and at least for maintaining the ecological processes of this planet and defending the commons on this planet, it is not capitalism, but countering the logic of capitalism that will make sure we have an atmosphere that's not getting so degraded, that climate change is wiping us all out, that the seeds being sold to peasants are renewable and not with terminated genes. There's always a role for activism. Um, I think the community organizing is one of the most empowered ways. And I think if people have access to a decent livelihood for work, um, then they're able to participate much more fully in all the kinds of campaigns that we need to save ourselves and save the planet.